Welcome to all. My name is Margarita Punara and I am a journalist for Kathimerini newspaper. We are here at the Zapion and we are going to, to discuss the neoclassical movement and how this is linked to the birth of the Greek state, but not just the birth of the Greek state. Uh, we are going to discuss with uh, a, a number of uh, specialists about this movement, which was very crucial for the rest of the world and for Europe too. Well, Getty used to say that architecture is frozen music but I don't think that all of us can listen to the melodies which are sung by the buildings. And we are very privileged today, <coughs> I'm very privileged, to host, to have with me four distinguished speakers who I think they can translate these melodies into theories and ideas so we can understand, we can have a better understanding of, of how the neoclassical movement uh, has, has affected uh, not just literature, but architecture too. Um, so uh, I will make a very brief uh, presentation, introduction about each one of uh, our esteemed speakers. I will start with George Prevelakis, who sits right next to me. He's now the permanent representative of Greece to the OECD and an emeritus professor at the Pantheon Sorbonne in uh, Paris. He was born in Athens, studied architecture and engineering, and he specializes in geopolitics. So I think he is the right person to talk about this idea of the neoclassical movement and how is it linked to architecture. Um, I will continue with Esther da Costa Meyer. She's a, a professor emerita in the Department of Art and Archaeology in Princeton University a native of Brazil, and she specializes in issues of cultural translation involving architecture. We also have uh, Monsieur Michel Espagne. He's the research director of the Centre National de Recherche Scientifique in France. He studied German, classical philology, and cultural studies uh, in Paris and in, in Germany too. And we have a historian with us, Evanthis Hadjivasiliou, he's also with us here at the Sapin, is a professor of post-war history at the University of Athens. And I have to say that this is the suitable place to have the conversation because Zapion is a neoclassical building mm. and something which we are all very proud of. So uh, I will start with Professor Prevelakis, floor is, floor is yours. So you can just in, introduce us to, to this theory of yours, which is very interesting. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Margarita. Well, in fact, uh, we, we, we are celebrating the 200 years of the Greek state, and a moment like that is also an opportunity to, uh, uh, to rediscover, to review, and eventually to change our, our vision. And uh, this is a, a very uh, essential uh, political question and geopolitical question, because the way we perceive our history and the relationship with the world defines also the way we behave towards the world and towards ourselves. And uh, as the world changes, we have to readapt, we have to change. Now, we have a very heavy heritage, intellectual heritage, uh, from uh, the way we have uh, interpreted the history of the Greek state, the, those two, uh, two centuries. Uh, and uh, I, I would say that uh, this discourse, that, this dominant discourse that, uh, that we have inherited is strongly influenced by philology. Uh, we have a historiography in which the uh, the philological approach is very strong. In fact, until quite recently, Evanthes knows that better than myself, the historians were philologists that specialized more or less to history. So we have this uh, component. 
Uh, and uh, I believe that this uh, uh, vision, this uh, discourse, uh, creates a kind of a gravitation. It's like a mass that creates a field of gravitation. And although, of course, uh, historians, the new generations of historians, those that have been influenced, for example, by the school of uh, Les Annales, by Brodel, uh, are trying to get away from uh, this gravitation, it's not easy. Uh, and uh, I think that <coughs> a way to get away and to develop alternative discourses is maybe to find other masses of gravitation, to look uh, outside the dominant field. Now, from, uh, from my own experiences, I have uh, discovered uh, at least two fields that might be useful in that sense. The first comes, of course, from my training as an architect, but also by the fact that uh, during the long years that I taught at the Sorbonne, I was in the Department of Geography, the only architect, so I taught uh, history of architecture, 19th and 20th century, for many, many years. And this led me to, to look uh, in depth into this history. And of course, I discovered that the way we perceive Greeks and even uh, architects by training uh, neoclassicism is very distorted. It is very distorted because, of course, neoclassicism has been denounced by the school of uh, Le Corbusier, of Bauhaus, etc., as a retrograde uh, style, a simple imitation of the past. And uh, from the Greek side, there's something that more or less is owned by Greece. And uh, the truth is, uh, and obviously our colleague Esther will develop that uh, much better than I can do, the truth is that neoclassicism is an extraordinary uh, movement, a revolutionary, an instrument of the change of Europe. We are at uh, the end of the 18th century, uh, and uh, uh, the, um, the, the first movement of neoclassicism, which is the revolutionary neoclassicism, uh, illustrates uh, the, the principles of the Enlightenment. And then, uh, during the 19th century, it becomes the showcase of the new ideas. Uh, and uh, this has an enormous impact on the populations. Maybe the intellectuals could uh, uh, follow the ideas of the Enlightenment through their thought, but the population had to see it, and they had the illustration. So neoclassicism is a revolutionary, very progressive uh, movement at that time, uh, and not at all what, what we thought. And this, of course, uh, realization uh, leads to uh, perceive neoclassicism in Greece in a very different light. Uh, the second uh, revelation, I would say, comes from Michel Espagne. He uh, uh, gave a talk uh, at the Greek embassy at a certain moment. He said something which uh, struck me. He said the Germans, in order to become German, had to become Greeks again. And those are ideas on which I have been thinking and working. And I have come up to a hypothesis to discuss, of course, which is the following that uh, uh, Europe uh, at uh, the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century is uh, entering in a, a period of transformation. Uh, of course, it starts earlier with the, the treaties of Westphalia, etc. But uh, this is a, a critical moment where, where everything is changing, uh, spiritually, politically, but also materially in the sense that we are on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we are at a moment where uh, science uh, becomes technology, and this uh, is in many fields, not only in the field that we can all uh, understand, which is, uh, for example, construction, the engineers, but also in military art, Napoleon is a scientist. And uh, at that moment, uh, it is necessary to uh, as I said before, uh, to convince the population to follow this movement of a changing world, to betray the past in order to get uh, into the future. And this cannot be done only by words. It has to be done also by, uh, by images, by the senses, by 
by things that you perceive through the senses. Uh, and in that, uh, in that field, neoclassicism is a very important instrument, and it is used. It is used by the construction of monuments. It is used in the, in the, in the realization of, of urban uh, compositions. It is a very important uh, uh, element in the life of Europe in the beginning of the 19th century. And then what happens is that there is a revolution in the Balkans. This revolution is presented, displayed, showcased as the Greek revolution. And this uh, must have appeared as an extraordinary opportunity, the opportunity to enlarge neoclassicism from the buildings and the, and the cities to a whole state, to construct a whole neoclassical state by using uh, a field which is extraordinary because it uh, uh, contains uh, localities, places that have the illustrious names of Athens, of Sparta, of Olympia. What an opportunity. So in fact, instead of seeing uh, uh, philalelism as the kind of help coming from outside towards a movement that is essentially moved by the element of Greeks, we can see also philalelism as a, a, a movement that starts from the, fr from the European needs. And therefore, in that sense, Greece has to be created independently of the Greeks. And the Greeks, who of course at that time were Greeks, but essentially they were what we call Rum, Romie in Greek, which means uh, Orthodox subjects of the Ottoman Empire, have to be transformed into Greeks according to the image, according to the image. Because in this neoclassical uh, construction, it's not only buildings, it's not only cities, it is also the population that has to uh, become adapted to this uh, reality. And this is something that is accepted by the Greeks, by the Rooms. So it's not an imposition. But of course, uh, this transformation is extremely radical and painful. And again, there I think we have to revise this image. I, uh, it's, it's a caricature, but this image that there is a kind of a Greek nation inside the Ottoman Empire ready to emerge on history. Uh, in fact, uh, what happens if we shift from this philological view and we go towards a more geographical view, that is, we take into consideration the material aspects of reality, what happens is that we have a space organized in the logic of the Ottoman Empire, pre-modern, etc., and it has to be transformed according to the logic of modernity. And the distance is enormous. The distance is enormous. What used to be a network space, what used to be a series of localities related through networks, which was the church networks, and in a, in a very fragmented, uh, fragmented society uh, with... Uh, uh, with uh, a management of violence which had nothing to do with the rule of law, where the brigands were at the same time the, um, turned into the gendarme, etc. Uh, it had to be trans transformed into a territory with frontiers, with borders, with centralized government, an enormous change, very painful for populations. We can imagine what, 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 what kind of change, not only in the minds, but also in the behavior that meant. Uh, and uh, this has been the task, this material aspect has been the task of the Bavarians, for reasons that I think uh, Michel Lespagne can explain uh, certainly much better than, than myself. So the Bavarians were um, the, the instrument of this neoclassical construction. They created neoclassical buildings, certainly, but their neoclassical creation goes much further in the effort to create a, a, a state, uh, a, a neoclassical state 
that uh, uh, would, uh, and a uh, neoclassical space, a neoclassical territory, in, uh, in deep uh, contrast with the reality on which it was constructed and out of which the materials of which the materials were, were, were found. And of course, I think that they, it is there where we find the main contradictions of Greece, because the past had its own capacity to resist, that we have had a certain resilience. This resilience, of course, very often leads us to criticize our incapacity to modernize, but at the same time, this resilience is also an asset that can explain certain aspects of the Greek reality, like, for example, the efficiency of the Greek merchant marine. But I think I will stop there, and okay. we can return to those questions later. Well, I will give uh, the floor to the lady um, of the company, which is Esther da Costa Mayer. Um, could you please say, say us a, a few more things about the, this movement internationally, because we Greeks sometimes were very possessive about the neoclassical movement. We think that is something which uh, uh, was born uh, in Greece and stayed here. It didn't actually, it, it had some radiation in Europe, but uh, we cannot perceive how popular it has been uh, elsewhere. So we need your help uh, to understand this, this radiation of the movement worldwide. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we can hear you very, very, well, very well. I'm trying to toggle this um, as I was taught, but it's not working because I have to show my PowerPoint. Where are you now? Which city? I'm at a, I'm a Princeton, New Princeton. York. Princeton, okay. Uh, yes, but the problem is that I was would you like this, us, but would it's you like us to give you some time? We can we can proceed with uh, Michelle yes, Espagne. I need and then we... to help me. I need the PowerPoint. Okay, mm. so uh, we we can give you some time. Um, yeah, we can shift to Michelle Espagne. Maybe. Okay, um, uh, Michelle Espagne, uh, are you with us? Can <laughs> we? Oh, voila, <laughs> Monsieur. Yes. Soyez le, le bienvenu. Uh, we would like to hear your view about the German perspective, because I can understand mm -hmm. that you, you can build this bridge between Greece and Germany, and also between um, the literary world and architecture. So mm -hmm. um, your, your point of view will be very useful for our discussion. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Spain. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you okay. very, very much. Yes. Well. Uh, according to the introduction of uh, Professor Prevelakis, uh, I will try in the next 10 minutes to focus on the question of uh, relationships uh, between Greece and uh, Germany on the basis of neoclassicism. It's almost banal today to call the extent that Germany constructed itself on the basis of its idea of Greece during the period that coincided with the Greek movement in German intellectual history around 1800. It became so because Greek art is declared unsurpassable and because the art of the ancients and essentially that of the Greeks must be imitated, but above all because the supremacy of Greek art is the result of a postulated political freedom. Greece participated in the construction of Germany's identity because it provided the model of a splintered nation dispersed into myriad urban organizations, which were sometimes at war with uh, uh, one another, but unified by a common language and by the same religious or literary references. One of the latter is, of course, Homer. The Greek people created itself, so to speak, through the progressive constitution of its epic. There was obviously a postulated analogy between Greece's constitution through the collective elaboration of the Homeric text and the constitution of a German nation through a national literature. The idea of a founding bond between the intellectual history of Greece and the founding of a German nation did not remain limited to the philological field, but also marked the very architecture of Germany. 
this architectural tradition of a reference to Greece, which was supposed to help Germany to affirm itself, is particularly visible in Berlin and Munich. In Berlin, when things above hold uh, of the many monuments of Greek inspiration built by Schinkel, the main uh, architect at the beginning of the 19th century in Germany, in particular the Museum Island and the Neuwache. The Athens and the banks of the Spree, that is to say Berlin, echoed the Athens and the banks of the Isar, that is to say Munich, whose creator was, in this case, Reza Leopold von Klenz, who gave us above all the buildings of the Königplatz in the center of Munich. Von Klenz is above all the architect of Valhalla, an imitation of the Parthenon built over the Danube as a pantheon of German greatness. Next to the Greek Germany, there is also a German Greece. A Bavarian administration was set up at Nathlio, then at Athens, until 1862. Even though not all of the German servants of the new Greek state were Bavarian, all of them, such as Leopold von Klenze, the architect of Valhalla, had gone by way of Bavaria and had become servants of the Philelem that was Ludwig I, Germany's first invent intervention in Greek history was a geographic nature. It was not so much a question of drawing the borders of a country that had just liberated itself, as it was one of drawing the imaginary borders of a myth. This myth required the drawing of a circle whose uh, ideal center was necessarily the Acropolis of the age of Pericles and whose radius corresponded approximately to the straight line out to Cape Matapan. I refer to uh, the works of, of Professor Kravelakis on this topic. Creating a state means defining a territory, a sovereign, and also elaborating the modes in which its citizens will be formed. Friedrich Thiersch participated in the negotiations which led to the nomination of King Otto, and he greatly contributed in his quality as a philologist from Bavaria and a specialist of Pindar to the formation of Greece's educational system. One of the most interesting characteristics of Thiersch's work concerning the education that was to be given to the Greek is that he published in French his book on the generation of Greece, the l'état actuel de la Grèce et des moyens d'arriver à sa restauration. So he referred mainly uh, to the model of German university. Along with Schingel, Leopold von Klenz provided sketches or projects uh, for the city of Athens. He went to Greece himself, where he was guided by Ludwig Ross the first professor of archaeology and, of course, a German. Uh, in 1847, Leopold von Klenz painted a picture representing the ancient Acropolis and the Aeropagus with the statue of Athena Promachos. He was one of the conceivers of a new Acropolis that would be transformed into a palace for uh, the Greek, that is to say, for the Bavarian uh, king. The construction of Greece is accompanied by an adaptation of the German contribution and Stamatios Kleantis, for example, who was Greek, accompanied Edward Schaubert in the elaboration of his blueprint for the new capital. But once again, a Bavarian architect, Friedrich von Gertner, who built the building in Athens, which today houses the Greek parliament. We know more recently that Ernst Ziller from Radebeul near Leipzig was the author of several hundred buildings in Greece, including the current seat of the Greek presidency, which was built uh, in the 1890s, and also the Academy of Athens. The symbolic German conquest of Greece exported itself to the rest of Europe. This was the case from uh, the very start. Winkelmann's History of Ancient Art was published in French as early as uh, the 1760s, in a translation by Gott the German Gottfried Selius, 
and uh, it uh, was um, an, an inspiration for all discourse concerning Greece uh, in uh, France at the end of the 18th century. It penetrated the entirety of French discourse about Greece from the date on. The idea of a general presentation of what Greece is through a pantheon of German philology and a biographical description of its principal features never ceased to haunt 19th century Germany. When Hermann Jusener guided his student Niels along the path of a general collection of archaic Greek texts, mainly those of Parmenides, Heraclitus, and Empedocles, he made Greece into a sort of base for German metaphysics. This essentialized Greece was given over to a reflection on being. Much time had to pass before this model was questioned and for the idea of a, a black Athena linked to Egypt through solid trade relations to become accepted. Greece was symbolically occupied while another sort of occupation awaited. From 1933 to 1938, the main Yaos demonstrations in Nazi Germany all took place in the Nuremberg Stadium. Of course, this was above all because the latter was a place capable of bringing together several thousands of people. But it was also an echo of the Greek culture of the stadium, which had now been transformed into a racist argument. The representation of bodies in the stadium puts the Greek model at the forefront. It could be said that the statues of athletes by Arno Brecker whose association with the Nazis can be dated to his representation of the athletes he saw at the stadium, reproduce and amplify Greek models. The German man must be a Greek athlete and look like Fidia statues updated to a contemporary thesis. Now the art is a, a pastiche of Greek sculpture, which it overloads with semantic layers that are quite obviously very foreign to it. The fact that from the uh, Gothian period down through Nazism, uh, Germany has been an imaginary Greece, made this peculiarity into the uh, heritage for the rest of Europe. We could not speak of Greece without speaking of the filter of German perception, nor of Germany without going into its fantasized relationship with Greece, uh, nor uh, of Europe without uh, taking into account this strange relationship between uh, Greece and Germany. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, am, I, I wrote down two words, the German Greekness, which is uh, very important as a term. I don't think that Greek Germanness could ever exist, but um, I, I think it's, it's important this time travel between Munich, Berlin and Athens and this, this bridge between uh, important architects from, from Klenze to Stamatis Kleanthis. And uh, uh, you gave us a whole Greek-German perspective and thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering whether uh, Mrs. Mayor Da Costa is now ready. Uh, we can see her. Uh, I'm, I, I'm gonna give up on the PowerPoint. I will speak to okay. Professor Espine directly. All right, so, please. Um, I, is that okay? Yes, so, absolutely. Although neoclassical, although neoclassical architecture uh, can be found in every continent, there is probably no country, uh, no place on earth, except for Greece, of course, <laughs> where it took root the way it did in, in Cuba between the early 19th century and the mid uh, 20th century. And during this long arc of time, uh, the politics and cultural connotations changed in response to the shifting social and political situation. So I can only evoke a few of these shifts in the meaning of neoclassicism in Cuba. And they resonate strongly with what uh, Professor Michel Espagne and also Professor Georges Pavelaki said before. So in France, uh, neoclassicism became the coin of the realm after the 1789 uh, revolution when it was instrumentalized by Napoleon's architects for buildings and pageants of the regime. Uh, and so it came to, to, to represent, at least initially, the probity and the austerity of, of the Republic. And scholars have pointed out 
uh, that Cuba espoused the liberal ideas of the French Revolution, and there a lot of that is true because France was very present in Cuba. In 1803, uh, Louisiana was sold to the United States, and there, that led to an exodus of French emigres who were given permission uh, to settle in Cuba. A year later, 1804, this, when the slaves finally overthrew the French masters in Saint-Domingue, now Haiti, again, there was an exodus uh, of French uh, uh, farm sugar planters to Cuba, which then replaced Haiti uh, as the first producer of sugar in the Americas. But the emergence of neoclassicism in Havana had a much more powerful subtext that was unusual because it focused on modern and not ancient Greece. Before any neoclassical buildings were erected in Cuba, its most distinguished romantic poet, José María Heredia, wrote a moving ode to the insurrections of the Greeks in 18, uh, 1821. Behold Greece overthrow its tyrants and serve as a temple to freedom. Here the world joyfully applauds such a victory in so glorious an example. Iridia, it's a very long poem of over 200 verses, but Iridia was the first to link Cuba's struggle of independence from Spain to Greece's struggle against the Ottomans. And this, of course, was a, Greek cut, a Greece cut to the measure of the revolutionaries' needs. Uh, it was forced by romanticism, and it was not based on philological, archaeological, or historical studies that would have to wait uh, to the 20th century. Winkelmann, of course, uh, and Professor Spangero mentioned him, had already underscored the link between Greece and freedom when he wrote in the history of art of antiquity, the independence of Greece originating in its constitution and government and its freedom was the reason for its superiority in art. Liberty, only liberty, has elevated art to perfection. But Winkelmann was thinking of ancient Greece, whereas Cubans were inspired by the Greece of their day, as were other Latin American revolutionaries. I need only mention Simon Bolivar, for example. So one can hardly overestimate the role of Greek independence in the Creole imaginary, that is, the Spanish-born people on the island who no longer saw themselves as part of Spain, the Creoles. So neoclassicism gave the struggling nation, uh, desperate to free itself from Spain, a cultural capital that bypassed the emphatic Latinity of the colonizers, remembering Greece was tantamount to forgetting Spain. So Havana's first neoclassical building was built in 1820, uh, 1828, right in the center of town to commemorate the founding of the city. It was commissioned by the captain general, that is the Spanish governor appointed to rule the island with an iron fist. Uh, but the style was chosen by Juan José Díaz de Espada, the bishop sent by Rome to oversee the Cuban uh, church. And Rome made a mistake. They thought he was a very old fashioned and a uh, retrograde man. He was in fact a man of the enlightenment and was shocked at the slavery based culture of the great plantation owners and of the complicity of the Roman Catholic Church. And so he continued to promote neoclassicism across the island. Yet in Cuba, neoclassicism never really uh, achieved an unequivocal meaning. It could serve the crown and its surrogates to express their hegemony just as it could serve the emergent Creole nationalism eager for independence. And both parties could use it as an instrument of racialized power over the disenfranchised Afro-Cuban population. And in fact, neoclassicism was initially taken up precisely by the slave-owning aristocrats because for them it had no particular political referent. And in the low hills outside the city, and I have images to show you, of course, they began building grand new classical summer homes uh, surrounded by gardens and fountains, uh, and, but a great many of them. So there's a whole, there was, there still is a remnant of a large neoclassical city made up of these isolated villas. And the new typology that they introduced there, these low slung porticos, so different from the compact palaces of old Havana, led to a major change which constitutes one of Cuba's enduring contributions to neoclassicism, uh, because in a, within a few years, the middle classes began to emulate the great aristocratic mansions outside the city, and the detached uh, houses or mansions, palaces, uh, with their neoclassical colonnades, 
were now introduced into the city, one after the other. So you have these long porticos that define streets. Uh, and this was an extraordinary a shift, a shift from private houses to long colonnades and porticos that defined the new thoroughfares of the new city that was expanding outside the walls of old Havana, Habana Vieja. And so this is, this is quite interesting because we see here, and this is, go back to what Georges Pavelakis was saying, something also important about neoclassic is the rise of the middle classes. It becomes the idiom of the middle classes, the entrepreneurial uh, bourgeoisie. And then from there, it percolates down. So the scale of the new city required the reevaluation of the role of architecture because buildings were no longer thought of as independent islands, but part of a broader picture, these long colonnaded streets. And in Havana, you see one after the other, perpendicular to the sea with these long stoas that go on, one of them for over three and a half kilometers, to give you the idea of the extent of these neoclassical streets. Now, once Cuba, once Cuba gained independence in 1902, Neoclassicism had to adapt itself to new social and political needs. It had to be yoked to the cause of nation building and promote Republican ideals of freedom and self-government. And so we also witnessed for the first time something that was already patent, of course, in Germany. Uh, but this was a new republic here that just emerged from obscurantism. But for the first time, we see a more scholarly approach to neoclassicism as Havana's first school of architecture was founded in 1900. And this shift is evident in one of the most remarkable uh, buildings commissioned by the government in the 1920s, the University of Havana, an extraordinary piece of urban planning and one that is deeply identified with Greece. It was the work of different architects uh, over several decades. And the university actually rises dramatically like an acropolis the slopes gradually down to the distant sea. And significantly, the site of, of this hill was chosen by Juan Miguel de Eagle, the professor of Greek at the university. And so in Havana, there's a perfect congruence between the magnificent location and the architecture. And it brings to mind uh, the famous analysis of the Acropolis by the French architecture historian Auguste Choisy, who wrote in 1899, that the Greeks always thought to harmonize architecture with the landscape. Their temples are as notable as they are notable as much for the choice of their site as for the art with which they are built. Uh, and so we see this very clearly in the University of Havana, where the rectorate uh, evokes Hans Christian Hansen's beautiful building for the University of Athens, completed in 1843. And the professor of Greek who chose the site had been to the University of Athens, so he knew this is not a, just uh, throwing out uh, an idea. No, there, there's, there's a, a, rea a reality-based idea there. But over the years, the formal re resemblance of Havana's university to Greek buildings grew more pronounced. Interestingly, um, as you look down the colonnade, the university is framed by several other neoclassical buildings. And when you look at it, uh, I think the architectural historians missed another Greek source, and that was the National Technical University of Athens by Lysandros Pachtanzaoulou. Uh, it is clear that they were looking at that when they saw the design, not just the red record, but the buildings that, that frame it uh, on two sides of the staircase. Uh, and in 28, uh, the grand staircase was added by the French landscape architect Jean-Claude Nicolas Forestier, who saw a resemblance between the hill in, in Havana leading up to the university and the one culminating in the Propylon on the Acropolis and basing himself on a conjectural 19th century reconstruction by Josef Kirchner, Forestier built this extraordinary uh, staircase that uh, rises slowly to the summit where it's crowned by the university. Now, neoclassicism's social alignments were complicated. It provided a shared vocabulary for the upper and middle classes, but not for the island's most marginalized group. Between the 17th and the 19th century, 600,000 slaves were abducted from their homes in Africa and forcibly bought to, brought to Cuba. Colonial Havana, based on the sugar trade and thus on slavery, was highly polarized 
and deeply scarred by segregation. And to end, I want to say something that is quite different in, in the American continent from you know, classicism in Greece. In the past few years, several scholars have underscored the connection between the emphatic whiteness of neoclassicism, the columns, the, the pediments, uh, the acrotaria, the statues, which of course are misrepresenting, of course, the origin, the architectural origins in Greece, but they've underscored the connection between this emphatic whiteness and the issue of race. Race understood, of course, as a cultural construct. And this is very controversial today. But this new approach had already been approached by the great Cuban writer Alejo Carpentier over 50 years ago in his novel Reasons of State in 1974, where one of the characters, an American, talks ironically of the whiteness of Mount Vernon, George Washington's grand summer, uh, grand home in the countryside with its columnar uh, front facade. And he says, there, an owner of slaves philosophized about the equality of all men before God. And Carpentier goes on to mention sarcastically the white, whiteness of the Capitol in Washington, where they intone the hymn of the Gettysburg Address, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Carpentier conveniently displaced this to the United States, but the fractures were all too evident in Cuba. And ironically today, in part due to the US embargo and in part to the political and economic priorities of the current regime in Cuba, there's an acute shortage of all building materials. And the columns, the neoclassical columns are today painted in the most assertively non-neoclassical colors imaginable, turquoise, bright orange, the kind of orange that hurts your eyes. And one sees that finally, neoclassicism is appropriated by all social groups. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving us this, the social history of uh, neoclassical movement. And also this, I think it's a fascinating story to talk about neoclassical Cuba and Havana. We, you know, we had, I have personally had no idea, I've never been there, but I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, to find out how different uh, things are there, but also the connections between the cities and between the periods and between uh, different chapters of social history. So I will now give the floor to our historian, Vanthis Hadzivasileou. I guess you're gonna speak about Greece, or? Yeah, I'm afraid <laughs> I will. Pretty much so, <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think our colleagues have established very well the function of neoclassicism as an international pivot, as an international movement and as an international pivot for modernization. Far from an idealistic return somewhere, I, I think neoclassicism was a forward-looking concept pro projecting various claims. For example, the incorporation of science and of rationalism in governance if nothing else, through the rediscovery of the philosophy of the Greek, uh, Greco-Roman world, uh, it also projected the sidelining of religion uh, as a determining factor of social organization. And even to some, to some extent, it also uh, pointed to the rise of the third state as a pillar of governance. Now, I may oversimplify things, but I tend to understand neoclassicism as the other side of the coin of the Enlightenment. In other words, as a profoundly revolutionary uh, cultural movement with salient political connotations. And in this sense, I do not seek historical accuracy in neoclassicism. Uh, it was a political and cultural statement which brought with it its own oversimplifications, to be sure, uh, but also its claims for the future. Um, it was not the job of the proponents of neoclassicism to be historically accurate. I mean, they were making a statement about what, how they wanted human society to organize itself. Uh, I must confess that my subject, I mean, neoclassicism in the Greek state, modern Greek state, um, well, it's a, it's a rather difficult one. 
if only because the Greek people's relationship with this classical past is a rather, uh, has some additional elements. As you said, Margarita, uh, it also involves a national claim, if not also an appeal for help, for assistance by um, uh, the West, by the Europeans. Uh, actually, it's very interesting that uh, the Greeks, during the time of the Greek Revolution and the establishment of, of the Greek state, were referring, actually, to a pefotismeni esperia, the enlightened West. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because the term West was not in use at that time, but it was West for us. Uh, and all these things were done, I mean, this national, this national function of neoclassicism, in the Greek case, uh, was done, of course, through the invocation of the glorious classical past. Just imagine, almost 2,000 years had passed since the days of Caesar, who, when confronted by the pleas of the Athenians who had joined the defeated Pompey, uh, Caesar is reputed to have asked them, quote, how long, how often will the glory of your ancestors save you from destruction? That was the first <laughs> century uh, BC. And it did save them then, and it did save them many times since then. Uh, Even now? Well, well, to some extent. Well, to some extent. Uh, so in other words, there is a certain, to some extent, expected kind of schizophrenia in the relationship of the Greeks with neoclassicism. Then again, one has to take into account that this Greek state, born in 1830, well, it was, not, it was so much different from the classical Greece that it invoked. I mean, in the end, ancient Greece was in many respects a great power in culture, in war, in trade, whereas modern Greece was a small state seeking protection. Now, I will not discuss here the much debated subject of the ambiguities of Greek independence or Greek sovereignty, uh, but I will point out that modern Greece, unlike the old, modern Greece is a regime taker, it's not a regime maker. And this shows prominently, I think, in Greece's attitudes towards neoclassicism. And last but not least, there is little doubt in my mind that this nascent modern Greece of 1830 was indeed full of contradictions. It was a Balkan society of the Ottoman Empire, socially fragmented, pre-modern. Uh, it is clear that not all the fighters of the Greek War of Independence fully understood what neoclassicism meant. But then again, I just wonder, is it not more or less similar in the other cases? I mean, how far was the, the enraged American of the Boston Tea Party fully conscious of the political philosophy of Benjamin Franklin? So I believe that with all the contradiction and ambiguities, and with much help, sometimes even imposition from abroad, the perception of the modern Greek state about the neoclassical spirit did not only involve an effort to secure foreign protection. And I would not agree that the modern Greek identity was kind of constructed or colonized by the per perceptions, the receptions uh, of the great powers. I believe that when all these are said, much remains that points to the conscious and deliberate use of neoclassicism by the Greek elites as a pivot for modernization and Europeanization of a pre-modern society of a part of the world which at that time was not Europe, it was the Near East. It was part of the Near East. And I would even go beyond that to claim that it was not just the elites I think that the Greek people themselves, or at least large parts of the Greek people, proved extremely eager to use uh, these processes of neoclassicism in their ambition to catch up, to progress and to become part of this pefotismeni esperia, the enlightened West. In other words, it was indeed a case of regime taking, but to use a modern expression, it was the Greeks that finally assumed the ownership of the program. Uh, I argue that the rise of neoclassicism in modern Greece was an interaction from both, both from above and from below. And uh, at least I claim that society acquiesced to it. Uh, admittedly, it was a messy affair, but these things usually are. 
the effort to use neoclassicism as an accelerator that would, that would lead to modernization is obvious in many aspects of the political and social life of the young Greek state. The political thinking of the Enlightenment dominated the various political constitutional texts of the Greek Revolution, from the invocation of natural law to the condemnation of tyranny or Ottoman despotism, which are really key words in the political philosophy of that time. The institutions also that the Greek rebels tried to build, they, they didn't manage to build them, by the way, but they, at least they proclaimed that they wanted to do it. Uh, Perhaps the first proclamations of the Greek Revolution, Alexander Ypsilantis' proclamation from the Danubian principalities were too radical. These were, I think, a case of overkill, uh, in the sense that uh, he made this reference to Brutus, wiping from his, uh, from his sword the blood of the tyrant, which was really self-defeating because, I mean, it did not go very well into the, uh, with the European chancellors who saw themselves in the role of the tyrant, not in the role of, the, of Brutus. But nevertheless, ma the making of a modern nation state had salient neoclassical undertones from the name of the Greek national currency, Phoenix under Capodistria, Drachma after that. Rising uh, from the... No, rising, no, Phoenix, rising from the ashes. Uh, rising from the ashes, yes, yes. Uh, the, 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 the rise of the new state capital, Athens. Um, Neoclassical Athens indeed was created by Otto's Bavarians, who, by the way, created from scratch another city uh, in southern Greece, Sparta. Sparta did not exist. It was built by the Bavarians, and this is why it has such great uh, hypodamian uh, uh, architecture. Uh, and uh, the process continued, nevertheless, well after Otto's removal as the head of the Greek state in 1862. The claims for democracy were clearly modeled uh, uh, to this glorious, perceived glorious national past. N not that Greek history was full of democratic periods, really. It, 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 democratic periods were really the exception, but at least it was, it was an invocation of this past. And this was reflected in the two constitutions, 1844 and 1864. The neoclassical Athens of the late 19th century, last part of it sadly lost in the frenzy of post-war reconstruction, uh, started with Otto's Bavarians, but continued well after that, until the early 20th century. Uh, last but not least, I think, perhaps this is equally important, neoclassicism, or at least classical culture, tended to create a common language between modernizing Greek leaderships from Eleftherios Venizelos, the translator of Thucydides, to the team of Constantine Karamalis, the people who brought Greece into Europe, a common language between them and their opposites in the West, uh, at least until the 1970s or 80s, because until that time, European leaders had a classical education. I'm not entirely certain that this holds for today. So was this use of neoclassicism an initiative aimed against traditional society? My answer is yes and no at the same time. Uh, it was an accelerator. It allowed for the integration into the national narrative of the claim for modernization. And for this reason, it created inroads also within the wider population. Uh, it was also a source of national pride. And this made it easier, perhaps, for neoclassicism to become accepted by uh, uh, the wider society. It was a way to integrate modernization and political liberalism into the national narrative. And I think this is the end, another reason why modernization, with all its difficulties and ambiguities, became entrenched in the popular narrative in Greece. It became part of the national narrative and then uh, uh, this, the, uh, and, and therefore it became, uh, uh, it, it never became an enemy of the national, uh, national psyche. It became a part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm keeping three things. First, 
neoclassicism as a vehicle for modernization, then transitional periods of time. These, are, these were trying times for people and trying times for nations and democracies and societies. Uh, and uh, the third part is the power it had to transform things. So uh, do you think that your theory now stands right? <laughs> Yes, first of all, I, I will not speak about theory, but rather for a, and out a, of the box. a hypothesis or a, hypothesis. a, a, a heuristic uh, form. I, I see, uh, I see no classes. Uh, first of all, I, I, see, I see this debate as a way to make our discussion about the Greek uh, history and identity more extrovert. And I think that what we have heard uh, today uh, show the various ways by which we can get out of this closed environment in which we have been living. And of course, we have been living in an introvert environment, uh, intellectual environment, for very precise reasons. Maybe it was necessary under the conditions of the Greek uh, uh, construct, geopolitical construction. It was necessary uh, out of a very fragmented society it was necessary to create a cohesion of this society. And you have to have a narrative, a very simple uh, linear na narrative in order to create this cohesion. But now we, we are going out of this era and also we have to confront much more uh, uh, complicated uh, and changing uh, international relations. And uh, we need to uh, look outside. So we are ready for this challenge, you think? Yeah, and, uh, and I think that uh, the, f the first thing is that uh, we have to overcome the, the silos, the intellectual silos that historians are studying history, architects are studying architecture, geographers which are more or less inexistent in Greece, again for very precise geopolitical reasons, uh, are someplace outside. We have we have to see the connections about, among, among those things. And then, of course, and I think that the discussion uh, and the elements brought by two, our, two, our two colleagues uh, uh, show that uh, very clearly, that uh, the, the, the center of the world is not, is not Greece, that uh, there are uh, the, the things we are interested in uh, have a, vast, vast, uh, a much larger uh, existence outside us, and this for example, neoclassicism, we tend in Greece to consider that it is essentially a Greek issue uh, and that it happens a, a bit uh, someplace else. No, it is, it is a global phenomenon of, of major importance that has its, uh, its impact in, in Greece. Uh, also that uh, uh, this Greek theme, uh, uh, the reference to antiquity, is, is very important uh, for other uh, cultures and uh, I believe that the, the German case is extremely interesting because probably the, 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 the German national construction uh, had to rely a lot on what was seen by the intellectuals as a precedent, as a historical precedent. So, so it's, not, uh, it's not, the idea is not to create a, a, another a narrative, but to see how through such a, a, an approach uh, we can start uh, moving outwards. Uh, the, the other thing I would like to say is that, you see, uh, architecture and uh, geography, again, are two disciplines that are seem different. But uh, for me, the, the, the architectural work functions to a large extent as a model for the geopolitical construction. Uh, and uh, and in the case in the in the Greek case, it's very clear, because what is the neoclassical spirit? It is that out of the chaotic environment, or what is seen as a chaotic environment, we uh, create order, we create clarity. Clarity. It's clear. Now, if we uh, think, and and this is valid, of course. For, 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 for Europe, uh, for Cuba. But uh, if we see it in the Ottoman Empire, uh, I think it's very relevant to think about the 
the way that uh, the Westerners were perceiving the, uh, the, the, the landscapes, the Ottoman landscapes. If we think of the sketches we have and the uh, lithographs and all those things of the Ottoman city, this kind of orientalist approach, it, it is completely chaotic. It is uh, uh, very, how to say, um, it's, uh, it's a mix of people, of uh, houses. You cannot understand what are, what are the roads, etc. The land uses and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, on that reality, neoclassicism projects order. Now, this is what's happening also on the level of the territory. We have those fragmented societies in which yeah, there are natural, religious networks, uh, violence is managed in a very different way. And uh, uh, what we do is we create territories, so we introduce clarity, but this clarity means also ethnic cleansing, because to clarify this, so we have this, uh, how to say, this wish to simplify, to clarify, to make things visible and easy to understand, which of course is a question of power. Because if you want to control something, you have to be able to see through. It is the panopticum. So, so I think that we have values, there are values, and, and of course what, uh, what Michel Espagne has shown is that neoclassicism, of course, is maybe very progressive in the end of the 18th century, but it also can become a kind of vampire as it happened uh, in Nazi Gen Germany. So again, there are various meanings. And, and maybe what we, if we want to feel more <laughs> as having an Ottoman heritage, what we can see is a kind of an imposition of clarity in the, in the case of the Nazi, Nazi Germany becomes uh, something very cruel. And in that sense, German Nazi neoclassicism is, is also a symbol of the cruelty of the, the Nazi regime. So, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of questions. And uh, uh, what I'm saying is that we have to open to those questions rather than close in, in repeating the same narrative again and again and trying to to polish small details in, in that narrative. Well, uh, my question to Michel Espagne is that, uh, as Mr. Prevelakis, as Professor Prevelakis, uh, Ambassador Prevelakis <laughs> said, um, the way we Greeks see neoclassicism has to do with a sort of uh, an introvert outlook of, of, uh, of our history, of um, the birth of the Greek state. But how about Germany, how they see this movement today, what is the legacy of the movement in, in, in contemporary Germany? If, if you take into account the history of the 1930s, uh, it's of course a, a dangerous uh, side of the history of architecture in the perception of um, Germany nowadays. But I think I appreciated very much the contribution of the colleagues underlining that uh, neoclassicism means at least uh, enlightenment. And uh, if we consider that neoclassicism is enlightenment, it means uh, that um, neoclassicism is a global phenomenon, a global phenomenon involving the architecture in Cuba uh, and uh, a sort of uh, Creole imaginary uh, um, as uh, it has been under, uh, underlined by, uh, by uh, Professor uh, Da Costa. Um, I, I think uh, nowadays uh, we can uh, um, observe references uh, to the um, model of neoclassicism all over the world. And um, from this point of view, there is no center of the world. If you observe uh, official buildings in Russia or official buildings uh, in uh, even in China, uh, you will uh, see the same uh, colonnades as in the, the, the long uh, uh, tradition of neoclassicism. And um, I, I understand that it's uh, difficult uh, to connect uh, 
uh, neoclassicism too uh, tightly to uh, Greek history, uh, because uh, if, if you do that, uh, you, uh, you you forget uh, the point of view of uh, archaeologists, for instance, observing that the, the first uh, Athena temple in the world uh, was built in Smyrna and had probably a, a Syrian background. The evolution of uh, Greek architecture uh, is not uh, isolated uh, from the evolution of, of, of architecture in the rest of the world, uh, not even uh, in antiquity. And um, I, I think it may be an enrichment uh, to observe that um, Greece and the architecture of Greece uh, transform uh, all sorts of heritage and uh, give, uh, gave the uh, heritage forward to, to the rest of the world uh, without uh, considering itself as uh, the center of this world. Well, I, I would also like to ask uh, Mrs. Da Costa Mayer, what is the legacy of ne neoclassicism in, in Central and South America and in Cu Cuba today? Uh, because I, it is a, a part of cultural history, architecture, but uh, um, how people are perceive these buildings? What is the story behind the buildings for them today in, in contemporary terms? Well, that's a very interesting question because you are now celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Greek Wars of Independence. And two years ago, Havana celebrated the 500th anniversary of the founding of Havana. And the humanity conference that they that celebrated the 500th anniversary of the founding of Havana was organized by the professor who holds the chair of Greek philology in Havana. And she had a conference where all Latin America, I mean, professors from Latin America came and talked about the heritage of the classics and the heritage of Greece. And who gave the great reception? The Greek ambassadors. The Greece has been supporting, which is interesting because the Greek heritage in Cuba, this is an island 6,000 miles from Cuba. It never, ever had a large Greek population, very few, 50 people maybe live there now. And yet this heritage has remained so strong that the Greek ambas uh, embassy has been supporting a center for Greek studies, Greek masters, giving out uh, fellowships. So that kinship is very, very strong. And what I heard at this conference um, was that uh, the other Latin Americans said the same thing, the importance of the classics in the rest of Latin America. So this is a very strong thing. And about the, the buildings in particular, these are the most beloved buildings, the capital and the university is one of the, the best universities as far as architecture is concerned in the whole American continent. I mean, is this fine? I mean, I couldn't, I'm sorry, I couldn't show you. It's a series of neoclassical buildings with all these references uh, to Greece and beautiful landscaping, a tropicalized uh, uh, acropolis, and they are in much, uh, they are beloved as, as they were in the past. And they are, that, that heritage is very much strong. It was part of the modernizing spirit of, of the elites. And the capital has just been restored under Raul Castro, uh, hoping that it would serve once more as, as the parliament of Cuba. We're still waiting for that moment, of course. So that heritage is very, very much alive. And the architecture who represents it is beloved, I would say, by the Cubans. Well, uh, dear Evandis, how about Athens? Because we know that sometimes uh, people, um, Greek people, Athenians, or perhaps the younger generation of Athenians, see these buildings as enemies. You know, they represent the state, they represent the sort of history that they, they need to, to, to break uh, uh, away from this history. So I'm, as w sometimes they do even uh, use graffitis or the other things. So I was wondering uh, whether uh, we feel secure about this heritage that we do have, mm. or even today they represent, this, this cultural, cultural heritage represents something which is threatening to some of us. Mm. That's a very good question. First of all, I fully agree that architecture is also a political and cultural statement. 
Take, for example, Washington, D.C. Official Washington, D.C. has been built on the model of a Greco-Roman city. More Roman, actually, rather than Greek, uh, architecturally. Reflecting, representing similar institutions, the Senate, the concept of republic, the, of democracy, and so on. All those heavy symbols. It's a statement. Yeah, it, it, it's a statement. It, it's a claim. Uh, less so in London or Paris, because there the new elements, the new trends, new classicism, had to coexist with older uh, uh, buildings. With all, uh, and it, so it became evident more gradually, at least in terms of the urban landscape. But as I understand it, Architecturally, neoclassicism is, or at least points to a trend which led to the creation of what we now call West. In these terms, uh, at least in my view, I'm very much relieved to, uh, to see that Greece simply followed this trend. It's not a case of Greek exceptionalism. It's, it's a kind of a, a safeguard, a guarantee for me, at least, to know that we're following, in the past 200 years, uh, larger trends and, and uh, I mean, the, the whole process of, you know, the, the, the rise of this, a, a whole cultural community, global cultural community in the end. I don't know if it is threatening. I don't think that it is threatening for anybody. Uh, okay, it was it, it, it architecturally started with the Bavarians, but the Bavarians started other things and we did not follow them. The Bavarians started, uh, wanted to create a, a reasonable tax system, but we didn't follow them in that. But on, on, on that trend, we followed them. We went on, we continued even after them. Which means that it, it took roots, I think. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think that it is a, a threat. Uh, unless, of course, we assume that it is a sign of rationalism, and rationalism may be a threat to a part of our society. But that's <laughs> a whole a big story. Quest for identity. Uh, well, no classical movement was, was a kind of answer to this quest for a number of countries. How about today? Could architecture be an answer to the quest of an identity? Hmm. How about this hybrid, difficult to understand today's world? Well, you know, as I, as I said in the beginning, I, I taught history of modern architecture for, for four decades. And I was able to explain to my students the significance, the political significance of neoclassicism, of neo-Gothic, uh, of uh, uh, the styles of the end of the 19th century. But I'm not sure, I don't know how we can interpret the architecture of, uh, uh, of the last years uh, in, in that sense, whether, whether it, we can we can, we can find the political meaning of the Bauhaus. Uh, could also find a, 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 a meaning in the construction of skyscrapers that are the symbol of the power of multinational companies. But uh, I, I find it very difficult to connect the architecture of today to some political meaning. Uh, Maybe our, our colleague uh, Esther can help us in that, yep. because she's working on those things uh, in a more uh, in a more specialized way. But I wonder if the the answer is that uh, this chaotic uh, architectural landscape is not also a reflection of a chaotic cultural and political landscape of our times. Uh. Mrs. Dacosta Mayor, do you, do you have an answer in this? Do you think that architecture today is a, is a sort of answer to our quest for an identity? Or lack of. I agree, I agree with George. I agree with George that we are so split up into different factions, into identity politics, that it will be very hard to find 
an architecture that is identical that, that satisfy the quest for identity of more than one group uh, and this this is something that is different of course from uh, from what we understand of neoclassism even though there too uh, the neoclassism in Germany and in Cuba and other nations um, reflected mainly the elites but it did percolate down there was an acceptance uh, of it uh, but there were the excluded as well and today uh, we are in a situation where there's a cacophony, uh, where different groups want to express themselves through architecture, but in ways that reflect their own, partic their particular reasons and not those of society at large. It's hard to find buildings that everybody would agree that represent some supranational, some national or supranational form of identity. Well, as I said in the beginning, architecture is music frozen in time. So we, if we could actually hear the music, the words, the melodies of a neoclassical building in Havana, Cuba, what it would, what it would say today? What if the building had a voice? Uh, again, today it would say it had a voice, it would speak different things to different groups. Um, the reaction, I mean, we were talking about Washington, D.C., uh, all of those ideals of freedom, of course, and all that city uh, representing this new Republic of America was, of course, built by slaves. And therefore, uh, neoclassicism speaks through different voices. However, I do want to say something. Go back. George was talking about the fact that neoclassicism is international. I mean, you find it in every continent. And you mentioned Greece, uh, you mentioned China, for example, you see enormous colonies in China, in Japan as well. But I would say that interestingly enough, it is only the second great international style. The first one was actually classicism. And Alexander went all the way to the Indus, I believe, in Europe, uh, Bactria and so on. But I think there's a part of all our countries, all our cultures, Greece in particular, that can only be understood from far away. It was only when I was in China visiting a Buddhist temple. Uh, I entered the temple and it was all dark. The, the faithful were there with their little candles and I bumped into something and I turned around to apologize and saw myself staring at an enormous wooden toe. There was a huge statue of Buddha. And the first thing I remembered was what I had studied in classes of Greek architecture, the statue of Athena Parthenos inside the Parthenon. In the dark, And it was yeah. the immediacy of that statue touching the, the top and the faithful around it that led me to think that finally I understood something about the Greece that had missed before the immediacy of the people there worshiping that. And I think that is very strong. You find bits of Greece all over the world sometimes disguised as Buddhist things, but it's there. Like the other, if I may mention one more thing, in Japan, the ninth century temple of Horyuji in Nara, where the columns are wood, the way the Greek temples were, and it's attributed to Greek influence. And I said, what ninth century, how could this be? It's the Chinese who came again as Alexander, who influenced through, through the centuries, those columns trotted around China and finally around. And this is, you can read this in the Nara, the first capital of Japan. Those columns are wooden the way the first, and again, there I understood or seemed to understand, at least have an inkling of something about Greece that I had never understood because those wooden temples are gone from Greece and that great statue, which was so influential, was gone from Greece. George. Well, I think uh, uh, that. Uh, Maybe this discussion about architecture and uh, what is the meaning of architecture to, today, maybe it tells us something about global affairs. In the sense that uh, we have two centuries, more or less, dominated by the spirit of neoclassicism, which is more or less an orderly world. And this is expressed in architecture because, in fact, even if we take modern architecture, if you take Miss van der Rohe, it's again the idea of clarity, the idea of transparency. 
we have a continuity, although they denounce neoclassicism, the, the ideal is the same. And now we don't see that. Well, maybe because we are moving away from a certain organization of the world, which was based on the nation state, uh, on, of course, on the Westphalian system. Uh, and we are getting into a much more chaotic world. So maybe the post-modernity resembles to the pre-modernity. And in that sense, the fact that uh, the Greek history has been influenced by the neoclassical spirit, but not totally, that <laughs> there are fields that have been preserved from the, uh, yeah, from the neoclassical ideal, maybe is an asset for a world which is becoming less and less neoclassical. <laughs> okay, I need your final comment, uh, Michel. Yes, I agree with uh, the talks um, yeah, of uh, Professor Pavelakis and Professor Da Costa. Um, we, can, we can see uh, that the, the Buddhas in, in Gandhara and uh, uh, the, the, the Chinese temples and the, perhaps the warrior in, in Xi'an uh, have a sort of Greek appearance. And uh, uh, it, uh, it, it means that uh, there was, uh, even in antiquity, a sort of a circulation uh, between Greece and the rest of the world. And I think that um, architecture is not, perhaps not uh, really a moment of national uh, identity, uh, but uh, a support of the uh, uh, circulation all uh, over the world. And um, it underlines the, uh, the, the importance of, of the phenomena of architecture, perhaps more uh, than if we consider it just uh, um, in, in touch with uh, one nation among others. Ms. Da Costa Mayer, your final comment? Well, my final comment is actually to thank all of you because I have heard very challenging things about neoclassicism from all of you. And I think I have to go back to my studies <laughs> and ponder about the other aspects of neoclassicism about which I learned today. So thank you, all of you. Thank you. Evanthis? Well, uh Every intellectual trend, cultural trend, as a historian, I will say it's a product of its time. I don't expect to see neoclassicism today. But I would like to make a comment uh, answering your question about what kind of music the, the, does a neoclassical building create today, not only in Greece, generally, in Cuba, perhaps. My feeling is when I see a neoclassical building anywhere, is that it radi radiates uh, a sense of optimism and expectation, expectations. And I like that. Perhaps I miss it in our societies lately. So it's not our uh, national anthem that you No, hear. no. Okay, and, then. and this is why it's reassuring, because it's not Greek exceptionalism. Okay. It's, it's part of a world community. That's an exception. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not yeah, Greek, okay. Greek exceptionalism. George, final words. Well, I have spoken too much, so I, I simply wanted to thank everyone. Thank Margarita, thank Evanthis, but especially thank our two uh, friends, uh, Esther and uh, Michelle, because they, uh, in this big debate about uh, Greek identity and Greek history, uh, they came and opened two windows to uh, connect us with the world and to bring uh, fresh air and oxygen in our debate. And I say, uh, as I'm leaving Zapion today, I'm going to see it under a new light, thanks to you. <laughs> Thank you very much for participating in our discussion and hope to see you in Greece.